Lander, as you saw from the posters, was uh, planning to introduce our speaker. Uh, but uh, the president, despite the fact that he's coming here, told Eric he had to be in Washington. Um, Eric is uh, co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and a meeting was scheduled at the last moment, so he has to be in Washington. Um, but So he asked his former postdoc advisor to step in, uh, and that's Bob Horvitz. Uh, Bob, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, was an undergraduate at MIT, uh, majoring in math and economics. Um, Bob sketched these things on the board for us before we started. Um, uh, in graduate school, he became a biologist, uh, and did his PhD at Harvard, um, and during his postdoc in Cambridge in the United Kingdom, he began studying C. elegans, especially its nervous system, and that has remained the focus of his work uh, for many years. He came to MIT in 1978 as an assistant professor and established a program using C. elegans to study how genes control animal development and behavior. In 2002, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering and characterizing genes that control programmed cell death. So we're very, I'm very grateful to Bob for uh, stepping in and introducing our speaker today. So first, I hope everybody has taken notes because we're going to be passing out the exam. Um, I'm delighted. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to be here to introduce Ed Scully in the as the first speaker in this new series that's been established by Peter Castro. Um, Ed is literally a legend in his own time in the world of pharmaceuticals. I've known Ed for about 20 years, and I can say he is an amazing force, both intellectually and personally. And I'll begin with a brief overview of, his his of Ed's history, and I'll go into a little bit more detail after, but I think his history really does illustrate, exemplify um, an unusual career path of the sort that Mark Kastner was just alluding to, as the goal and the focus of, of this series. Ed trained as a physician. He then became a research biochemist, and he made major contributions to the process of protein synthesis, a process that I should say was recognized very recently by a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Ed then turned to an entirely new field, tumor virology. And he discovered the key cancer gene, the RAS oncogene. Next, Ed entered the commercial world of the pharmaceutical industry. And he was responsible for the pioneering research accomplishments of Merck over an exceptional 22-year period. Then Ed changed direction once again. And in the past few years, he has become a leader in applying genomics to the problems of neuropsychiatry and mental illness. I've had the privilege of interacting with Ed in a number of these contexts. In 1990, my lab published a paper describing for the first time the normal biological function of a RAS gene. Now, it was Ed who first named RAS genes, and more importantly, identified them as responsible for the cancer-promoting activities of certain tumor viruses. In 1990, Ed was president of Merck Sharpen Dome Research Laboratories. Ed called me on the phone. And he said, what do you know about RAS genes? A few months later, he called me again. And again, I don't remember how many times Ed called, but I learned something. I learned that Ed is relentless 
And, and I think that's a characteristic that has really typified him in all that he pursues. Also during this period, I got to know him and to respect him as a deep thinking and critical scientist and also to like him. The second context in which I've known Ed is commercial. Ed and I have served together as advisors in two commercial contexts, first to a biotech company and secondly to a venture capital company. And I'd like to just relate one experience at the biotech company. And I can see Ed sitting there getting progressively more and more nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so this company was considering in licensing a compound to develop as a treatment for cancer. Lots of homework had been done and there was a ton of material that was this thick. And we were sitting in a meeting, I was sitting next to Ed, and a company executive came in carrying this tome and tossed it down in front of Ed and said, what do you think? Okay, over the next 15 minutes, Ed kind of took this stuff page through it. I mean, literally, it was like he was just absorbing it by osmosis. And then he interrupted the meeting, and he said, the issue is paragraph two, or whatever it was, <laughs> on page 86, or whatever it was. And then there was this pause, and everybody was quiet, and one of the people in the company said, he's right. We haven't looked at that. We should, and we will. And I would say whether it's by intuition or experience or some combination of the two, Ed has repeatedly impressed me with his ability to truly get to the heart of a matter. The third context in which I've known Ed is right here at MIT. First, Ed was a member of the visiting committee of the MIT uh, Department of Biology from 1994 to 1998. And Ed has also been a member of uh, the board of directors of the MIT McGovern Institute for Brain Research, and I see Pat McGovern sitting right here, uh, the MIT uh, McGovern Institute for Brain Research since the founding of this institute in 2001. I'm a faculty member both of the Department of Biology and of the McGovern Institute, and I have to say that I have very much appreciated Ed's deep interest and his very active involvement in both biology and neuroscience here at MIT. I also know that the McGovern Institute each year awards a prize. The prize is called the Edward M. Skolnick Prize in Neuroscience. And this prize was endowed by Merck to honor Ed's contributions. Okay, a bit about Ed's history. He was born here, Boston, not Cambridge, Dorchester, I think, is that right? Yeah, Dorchester. And he stayed local for some years. He was an undergraduate at Harvard. He graduated in 1961 and received his MD from Harvard Medical School in 1965. Did his internship and residency at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And then in 1967, he moved to NIH where he stayed for 15 years. He began his career as a researcher at NIH and worked with Marshall Nuremberg and focused on how mRNA stop codons work to terminate protein synthesis uh, in protein elongation during protein synthesis. And then Ed began to be interested in cancer. And he was one of the pioneers who initiated the study of tumor viruses with the goal of understanding the genetic basis of cancer. And he moved at NIH from the Heart Institute to the Cancer Institute. And it was there Ed discovered the RAS genes that I mentioned earlier. And specifically, he found the two rat retroviruses, retroviruses enter the picture again later in Ed's life in a different context, Two rat retroviruses carry specific sequences derived from the mammalian host that confer upon them the ability to transform cells from a normal state to a cancer-like state. And he named these genes RAS, R-A-S, 
for rat sarcoma. These and others of Ed's findings concerning rat genes were both pioneering and landmark. In 1982, Ed moved from NIH to Merck, and he began as executive director of virus and cell biology research, but rapidly was promoted to president of Merck. 1985 to 2002, he was president there, and during this period, he led the development and, and, and or introduction of 29 new medicines. And let me say in the industry, that is a spectacular and remarkable number. These medicines have revolutionized the treatment or prevention of diseases, and we were just talking about this before, uh, these comments, diseases as diverse as hepatitis B, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, AIDS, and cervical cancer. And Ed's role here um, cannot be understated. He has affected in major ways the lives probably of hundreds of millions of people. While at Merck, both at Merck and outside Merck, Ed was legendary for his energy and his drive. Okay, so at this point, I'm on a quick diversion before I finish with a little bit of his history. So I decided I was going to look on the web to see if there was anything I could find out about Ed that I didn't already know. <laughs> the web is amazing. So I found the website, and on this website, there was a title called Sample Business Contracts. And there I found the contract between Ed and Merck describing his termination as president and his continuation as a research scientist. Okay. And I read through this contract, and I've read numbers of contracts before, and it was more or less typical, but there was one phrase that, at least for those of us in this audience, uh, was would, would not be entirely typical. And it was uh, the last part of paragraph three. Um, which read, while Dr. Stolding remains an employee of Merck, Merck will allow him reasonable use of Merck corporate aircraft. <laughs> so my comment to Ed is, welcome to academia. <laughs> Just to finish quickly on his history, while at Merck, Ed developed a strong interest in mental illness. And in 2004, he left Merck and his corporate aircraft. And uh, at an age when I think many people retire, came here to the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, which I think at Harvard is called the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. And we can go on with that, but he anyway, came to the Broad Institute and became director of the Psychiatry Initiative at the Broad. By 2006, two years later, he had raised a $100 million gift from the Stanley Medical Research Institute to allow him to analyze thousands of DNA samples from people with schizophrenia and bipolar disease. This funding allowed Ed to found the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research at the Broad Institute. And today, you're going to hear from Ed about these efforts, as well as about, I think, some of his previous experiences in applying basic research to the cure and treatment of disease. His title is The Power of Basic Science Applied to Medical Progress, Past Examples in Hope for Schizophrenia and Bipolar Illness. And let's all welcome Ted Stone. So first of all, uh, it's a great honor. Thank you, Dean Kastner, for inviting me to do this. It's been great fun. Um, I want to start by thanking Jan Kranz and Liz Morris for helping me put this presentation together. 
those of you who know me know my PowerPoint skills are somewhat limited. Um, when Elizabeth Chaitis called me to ask me to give this talk, I asked her, well, that's great. What do you want me to talk about? And she thought for a minute, and she said, well, what you did and what you are doing. So today's talk will address Elizabeth's questions. Um, I have always been excited about the inherent beauty of molecular and biochemical insights into how biology works. <clears throat> Making a scientific discovery, for me, is tremendously emotionally satisfying and, in fact, addicting. But I have been even more motivated to see how such insights can be translated into benefits for patients. So today, in this talk, I'll focus on three things. One, the principles that allow for successful translational research in <coughs> medical uh, biology. I'm going to tell you three examples from the what the editorial I did before coming here that illustrate these principles. And then I'm going to tell you about the Stanley Center, which in collaboration with MIT and the Harvard communities is trying to decipher the genetics and pathophysiology of psychotic illness, that is schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, using these principles. And thus, what we're really trying to do is revolutionize how research is done on severe mental illness with the overarching goal of dramatically improving patients' lives who suffer from such illnesses. So with that, um, and uh, briefly, a couple of uh, introductory slides, I actually had a history with MIT even before coming here. Um, I took a course in 1960 when I was an undergraduate at Harvard with Salvador Luria and Boris Magasanic. I had many, many colleagues during my time in tumor virology and competitors, great scientists and great people who I've known over the years and whose friendship I have really valued. Um, when I was at Merck, we had a, a significant interaction with MIT biology department to support postdocs and graduate students, and then I joined the Broad Institute in 2004. Just to go over my personal history for you very briefly in another way, I worked, as Bob pointed out, for 15 years at NIH, worked on the genetic code, RAS, and something else that I'm extremely pleased about, the peculiar oncogene of the friend erythroleukemia virus. And then I was at Merck, and then I've come back to MIT. So in thinking about uh, translational research and drug discovery, there are two really important points on the first two slides. The, the single largest reason for success is actually that you know the biochemistry of the disease you're going to work on, and you don't have to guess at it. And the second is the converse. The single largest reason for failure is having to guess at that and not really knowing that. Two examples from the field of mental illness are shown on, the first, on this slide. A number of companies based on some pharmacology, but no uh, clear relationship to humans, uh, guessed that dopamine 4 receptor antagonists might be a novel and better way to treat schizophrenia. And they made compounds which were very potent. They took them into clinical trials, and they all failed. In the field of depression, substance P antagonists were tried, and they failed. Neither of these guesses about how to treat mental illness better were based on any genetic insights into the underlying biology of either disease, despite the evidence that both these diseases are highly heritable. So what about genetics and medicine and drug discovery? So I'm going to talk to you and give you two examples from traditional Mendelian genetics, Mendelian genetics being highly penetrant single genes, which, can, which when mutated can cause disease, and then mention two examples from uh, disease risk genes that have a very small increased risk for uh, getting the human disease, but which also, as you'll see as we get into the talk, can have just as an important role in trying to figure out what to do about the disease. So the first example, it comes from a genetic discovery that was made in humans back in the 70s by uh, two investigators, one from Cornell University and one from uh, UT Dallas Southwestern. They discovered two families that had uh, male pseudohermaphrodism, a sexual abnormality at birth, and the one of the phenotypic characteristics of these patients is they were born with and remained with small prostate glands over the life of these patients. They discovered that the gene that was mutated and deficient was an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase, 
which transforms testosterone to its more active form, dihydrotestosterone. And this led Merck to start a program to try to make inhibitors of this enzyme to try to shrink enlarged prostate glands, which affect uh, elderly men. That actually worked, and later on, actually, the drug was shown to reduce the risk of prostate cancer as a primary prevention therapy. So that's a simple example. You know the gene, you know the function, you make an inhibitor, and you end up actually with a very important drug. The second is more complicated and is probably the more usual way in which Mendelian genetics has led to new treatments. And it's a rare disease this time called Marfan syndrome, in which patients uh, get an enlarged uh, blood vessel that comes from the heart, the aorta, and uh, prior to this discovery and the implications of the discovery, um, the surgical repair of the aorta was the only way to approach it, and eventually the aorta just kept degenerating and burst. Um, a number of years ago, uh, the gene for, that's associated with a cause of Marfan syndrome called fibrillin-1 was discovered, how it was abnormal. Fantastic scientist at Johns Hopkins Medical School named Hal Dietz discovered how the abnormal fibrillin led to the abnormal pathophysiology, which led to the aorta enlarging and bursting. And then he went even further. He discovered that, that through that biology, he had an insight that if you used receptor blockers of the little peptide hormone angiotensin, that this might actually improve the lot of these patients. And not only does it improve the lot, it actually arrests the disease so the aorta is no longer enlarged. It is a life-saving treatment. So this is more complicated. It's an example of going from the gene, understanding the biology, and then targeting on a way to do something about it. In the kind of genetics now going on in human genetics in the last three or four years, there are two examples of risk genes which confer a much smaller degree of relative risk to humans, HMG-CoA reductase and statins, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the second example, a gene called PPAR gamma, <clears throat> which is a, a receptor for, uh, which regulates transcription in cells. And there are two drugs on the market, actually, that are very important drugs for the treatment of type 2 diabetes which are listed, and they are agonists at this receptor. Now, they weren't discovered. They were discovered before the genetic role of this receptor in diabetes was identified. But it's important to realize, in fact, David Altschuler and his colleagues a number of years ago um, described a variant of this PPAR gamma gene, which has proline instead of alanine, and indicated from their very meticulous work that this variant conferred a small increase in relative risk to get type 2 diabetes. And the um, implications of this are, uh, were proven biologically by another group in uh, more recent years, illustrated on the bottom of the slide, that put the proline variant into mice to substitute for the normal mouse variant. And lo and behold, these mice um, get diet-induced obesity and glucose intolerance. So not, the genetics was right. The genetics led to biology. And historically, um, there is a drug working on a gene that confers a tiny relative risk, but still has a really important role in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And we'll talk about the statins and cholesterol in a minute. So one of the great examples, and Bob partially alluded to this, of where basic science and genetics over a decade or a decade and a half has led to a real revolution in the treatment and diagnosis of human cancer. There were probably anywhere from 200 to 1,000 people working on DNA and RNA-containing tumor viruses from roughly the mid-60s to the early 80s. And an enormous amount of information was gathered about how these viruses changed cells from normal cells into cancer cells. The cellular oncogenes, SARC and RAS, were discovered. It was discovered that these viruses had basically captured these genes, and they had been altered from the normal form. And this was the reason that these viruses could cause cancer. It led to the elucidation of biochemical pathways, which are still being elucidated, about how the abnormal gene leads to the cell uh, growing abnormally. And then a fantastic discovery made by Cliff Tabin and Bob Weinberg here in 1982 that the first example of an activated abnormal human oncogene, the RAS gene in a human bladder cancer cell, which truly changed the world and cancer research 
and which took a field which had perhaps 500 or 800 people working in it to a field that has thousands of people. It has revolutionized the work and the subsequent work has revolutionized the treatment of cancer. Examples of drugs that have been brought into human use are shown on this slide. There are at least seven or eight other examples, and there are dozens of compounds in the clinic. And although the New York Times decided to write an article a couple of months ago pointing out the imperfections of current cancer treatment, if you ask the question the way they did, have we cured cancer because of oncogene research in a global, complete way, the answer is obviously no. Have we improved dramatically the lot of patients with cancer and, in fact, cured some patients with cancer that otherwise would not have been cured? The answer is an unambiguous yes. And I think that that article was really uh, mis, mis, uh, uh, inappropriate for what the field has really accomplished. Without the genetics of cancer, none of this work would ever have gone on. The statin story and epidemiology of cholesterol and cholesterol and heart disease is another terrific example of how basic research has impacted people's lives. The real work here, I think, began with an epidemiology study, the so-called Framingham Heart Study, in which a number of families were followed for a long period of time and had their blood tested for a number of uh, chemicals, including cholesterol. And it was shown in the Framingham Heart Study that elevated levels of cholesterol were a risk factor for heart disease. What's going on in modern genetics today, human genetics, finding common gene variants that confer risk, is really modern epidemiology and public health epidemiology. It doesn't answer all the biological questions, but it opens up a direction in the same way that measuring blood cholesterol opened up a new direction for the treatment of heart disease. A rare mutation in the LDL receptor for cholesterol discovery by Brown and Goldstein in the 70s clarified the specific role of LDL in uh, atherosclerosis. And this work was uh, built on a number of years before this, work on the biochemistry of cholesterol synthesis, and the, the, the pioneered by Conrad Block, and the role, the specific role of the enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase, done by Marvin Sipperstein at Dallas, which showed that this was the rate-limiting enzyme for cholesterol synthesis. Now, in an earlier slide, I pointed out to you that there's a common variant discovered by Katharisen and his colleagues in which that variant of the gene leads to a small change in blood LDL, 4 milligrams per deciliter. Statins, as indicated on the bottom of the slide, can dramatically lower cholesterol, much more than that. So the magnitude of the effect of common variants, both for PPAR gamma and for the statins on hmg coa reductase, do not preclude having a really good drug that can have a much larger and much, much larger biochemical and much larger medical effect. So when you're in the real world and you get to this point where first statin was actually registered for human use, you might think you were done and uh, people would just go ahead and use the drug with all the historical information that cholesterol was important. But I woke up one morning two years later and found this Atlantic Monthly article with this cover, which I thank the MIT library for having a copy of, saying the cholesterol myth. Diet has hardly any effect on your cholesterol level. That's actually true in part. The drugs can lower it, often have serious or fatal side effects, and there's no evidence at all that lowering cholesterol will lengthen your life. Well, at the same time Evacor was registered, we knew what the issues were with the long-term issues that were not known about the drug, and we began, even at that time, a five-year double-blind placebo-controlled prospective trial in patients who already had heart disease to see if treatment with a statin, in this case simvastatin or Zocor, could affect not just their symptoms, but the natural history of the disease. Could it improve their lives by treating them with a drug which lowered LDL cholesterol? And this study was published in The Lancet in 1994. It was done in Scandinavia that has a healthcare system that allowed us to do the study well, and we, it was no patients lost to follow up over five years. There were 2,000 plus patients in each arm of the study, with and without simvastatin. Heart attack rates, hospitalizations, catheterizations, anything you want to measure in cardiovascular benefit was proven in the study. That's not what this slide shows. What this slide shows 
is that the effect on reducing the death rate from heart disease in patients who already have heart disease was so large and the drug was so safe that you dropped the absolute death rate in this patient population. This study is just as important in the history of medicine as the first treatment of pneumococcal pneumonia with penicillin. And we were extremely gratified when we did it. We knew that this study was ongoing at the time. The Atlantic Monthly published this, and it was kind of sweet to see the study come out and prove that they were wrong. The last story from my past history before coming to MIT, I'm going to tell you a story about Crixivan, a protease inhibitor for the AIDS. It's excerpted from an article published in the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1996 by the authors who are listed on the slide. If you're interested in reading the full article, my assistant Liz Morris has PDF versions of it, which she can give you. There are a lot of people involved in this, uh, this story, this play. Um, some of them are listed here on the slide. I wanted to recognize their roles, and I see one of them in the audience, Manuel Navia did the x-ray crystallography on the HIV protease. A number of AIDS activists were involved, and one of them will show up later in our play. And then a number of really uh, important people in the history of this program from clinicians, Tony Fauci uh, and David Kessler, who, in my view, was a terrific FDA commissioner. The AIDS as a disease was first reported in 1981, small number of deaths, thought not known what it was caused by, a disease identified in gay men initially, I believe, in the San Francisco area. Two years later, within two years, the virus was actually identified. And the most important observation was made. And I kept asking this question over the first two years of the disease before the virus was discovered and after the virus was discovered to know whether we should actually work on this at Merck. And that is, was it heterosexually transmitted? Because the minute that was proven, given the history of people's mores and sexual uh, habits, and the fact that this is a retrovirus, which once you're infected with, integrates into your genome, and you'll never get rid of it, that this would be a worldwide problem, a major public health problem. And we had to do something about this. The biomedical community had been well supported by NIH grants over the years. and if it failed to produce important new treatments for AIDS, there would be a terrible backlash against that funding. Shortly after that, a wonderful young scientist popped into my office with the following insight. This is bioinformatics in 1984. Rose sarcomavirus has an essential aspartyl protease. I bet HIV does too. It's a retrovirus. We had a renin program at Merck and other aspartyl protease. We should try to make an aspartyl protease inhibitor. And with great corporate governance, I said, Irving, go do it. <laughs> In 1987, the FDA approved AZT, the first drug for, for, for AIDS, and the death rate was rising. AZT was the first available drug, not a terrific drug, but the only thing available. By 1988, it was clear that this was going to be a global problem. In early 1988, Nancy Cole, trained here at MIT, had proven finally in cell culture that we could block the replication of the AIDS virus with a protease inhibitor. Manuel had crystallized the enzyme. There were protease inhibitors being synthesized. There was tremendous excitement. We were ready to really take on this virus in this field, and Irving, who was a genius in science, literally a genius, was leading the group. We were very excited. And the first twist and turn in our play occurred in December 1988, when I received a phone call late one <clears throat> afternoon, just before Christmas, telling me that Pan Am 103 had crashed over Lockerbie, Scotland. So I said, well, that's really sad. Why are you calling me? because we think Irving might have been on the plane, but we're not sure. He had two plane tickets. Several phone calls later and a few hours later, it was clear that Irving had died in Pan Am 103 just before Christmas. It was good that we had Christmas to at least partially recover. And shortly after that, in 1989, Joel Huff, who was head of chemistry in our, one of our sites and other people in the group, decided we couldn't let Irving down. We'd have to continue the project. <clears throat> 
enormous chemistry effort. We used to meet every few weeks as huge project teams to make sure we had as much effort in the project and resources as we could. And we had a great compound in 1990 ready to go into animal toxicology testing with great excitement. And the second twist in our play, two days later after it was in animals, we received a call that it was grossly toxic in animals. It caused liver necrosis. Stop the project. And fortunately, we were also at the time pursuing non-nucleoside inhibitors of the reverse transcriptase. The chemists who were working on the protease problem were clinic literally clinically depressed. And we stopped meeting every month because there was no point. They really needed an emotional, uh, emotional uh, rest from the intensity of the project. But we were pursuing these other approaches to the treatment of AIDS to inhibit the reverse transcriptase better than AZT. And we took two nucleoside, two of these, into clinical trials, and they both failed due to viral resistance. The activists in the field were concerned. They thought pharma would drop the effort. And I had significant pressures from above to actually stop the program. Two years later, they had another protease inhibitor, which turned out to be Crixivan after a large effort and enormous effort in, in medicinal chemistry. But this was only the beginning. We had to actually make the compound for clinical trials. Process research led by Paul Ryder did an amazing job. They worked out a 16-step synthesis with five chiral centers. And we made 100 pounds of Crixivan from, it took a year, enough for an initial clinical trial in 50 patients. This time, it passed safety. And we were, again, euphoric. The AIDS activists were threatening to picket the Merck site because we weren't going fast enough, not recognizing how hard it was to make the drug. And Linda Distelrath helped, uh, who I'm mentioning later on in our public affairs department, helped keep that from happening. In the first trial, 10 patients, 12 days, we got very encouraging results. We had a little more drug. We scaled up to 60 patients over six months. And the first results were really terrific, presented by Hedy Tepler at a national conference. Good drops in virus measured by a radium you know, assay, which we'll come to in a minute. Uh, good drops in viral replication and enormous increases in CD4 lymphocyte counts. The target cell that the AIDS virus causes a decrease, is a decrease in and is responsible for the immune deficiency of the disease. We were extremely excited. We were using a radio immunoassay to measure in blood the major viral protein. That was the only validated assay available to follow viral replication at that point. And while we were doing this, we were trying to validate a PCR assay measuring viral RNA in human blood, which at the time had never been used in a clinical trial. And lo and behold, the third twist of fate. <clears throat> On a Friday afternoon, in January, late one day, John Condra got the results from the first PCR assay. And despite the fact that the viral protein was still undetectable in human patients on the drug, the viral RNA had come back up and was positive. So John called Emilio, Emilio called me, and at 10 o'clock on a Friday night, I called Tony Fauci, my old friend from NIH. And after a few uh, conversations about it, Tony said, Ed, I don't care, you've got resistance. I don't understand why the two assays are discrepant. So what should we do? Should we drop the project? Almost everybody at Merck wanted to drop the project. We had had so many failures. But at this point, we were very dispassionate, looked at all of the data very carefully, and we had two observations. First of all, the CD4 counts in the patients a measure of the function of the immune system was still elevated. And secondly, by a miracle that occurred, we had one patient over 16 weeks, who was called patient X, who had no detectable viral RNA in, the, in his blood with monotherapy with an imperfect dose of Crixivan. Now, I was trained in medicine and learned about the first treatment of pneumococcal pneumonia with penicillin. And it only took one patient with that drug to prove that penicillin would cure pneumococcal pneumonia. So with that background and this one patient and the CD4 count, we reasoned that if we up the dose of Crixivan and used combination therapy, which was <coughs> the, the uh, way that tuberculosis was treated a number of years ago, we could affect a positive result like this in a much larger numbers of patients. <clears throat> 
we still didn't understand the artifact the, or the result that the radio amino assay showed no detectable virus, even though the RNA levels showed that we were getting resistance. And we felt we had to understand that before committing to the rest of the program. So radio amino assay takes an antibody on a solid surface. It captures the protein of the virus. And then you come in with a radio labeled antibody in tiny amounts. And if the protein has been captured by the other antibody, you get a signal. So if there's virus in patient serum, you get a signal. If there's no virus in patient serum, you don't get a signal. And there was an artifact in the assay that no one had ever discovered because the CD4 counts had never been elevated like that in a AIDS trial. Anybody want to guess who I haven't told the story? We had elevated the CD4 counts so much that the patients were making unlabeled antibody, cold antibody to this protein, which was blocking out the tracer label. And it was a massive assay artifact. We understood the assay, we understood the patient, the CD4 counts, and we went on <clears throat> and committed to increase the dose of Crixivan, a triple therapy trial by, <laughs> by working with other companies even before their drugs were approved for trial. And we went into phase two, which worked uh, very promisingly. And then Ray Gilmartin was uh, <clears throat> sympathetic to our committing to a phase three trial. Large numbers of patients all around the world two pounds of drug per patient per year, 500 tons per year produced in these two plants in the southern part of the United States. Finally, in 1996, the data came in from the phase three trials. 40% of the patients on single therapy had no detectable virus. Triple therapy, 90% of the patients had no detectable virus after six months. And Tony Fauci said something different this time. Patient X, two years later, remember what I showed you earlier, still undetectable. It is literally a miracle that this patient was in the first trial. New drug application was, was approved. The AIDS activist, instead of picketing our site, got up in front of the committee and said what Linda Grinberg said. And the drug was approved. It was the fastest approval in the history of the FDA. Patient X still had no detectable virus and the death rate from AIDS, at least in the developed world, dramatically dropped. So I want you to remember the AIDS story and its twists and turns as I turn now to what we are doing in the Stanley Center and the hard course ahead in that field. I came here in 2004 and we were fortunate to be able to start the Stanley Center after getting the gift that Bob talked about in the beginning of 2007. I believe that there's an unprecedented opportunity here at MIT because of the proximity of Brain and Cog and the Broad Institute and, and the biology department and a wonderful set of collaborations across the bridge at the Mass General Hospital and the Department of Psychiatry with some just terrific people. We have first-rate neuroscience, first-rate human genetics, and first-rate chemistry available in this environment. A unique opportunity to do something about a field that desperately needs exactly the kind of approach and change that we were able to bring to the AIDS field. The Stanley Center in 07 was begun. All the people involved, I'm not a human geneticist, I've only helped get the money so that Pamela and Sean and their colleagues at the Broad could really work on this project. Lee Wei has been a marvelous collaborator and, uh, and in, in person with uh, tremendous uh, support for our program. She's now head of the Pick Hour. And we've had great support from our collaborators in the various platforms of the Broad Institute. We're talking about bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, recurrent manic depressive episodes, schizophrenia, delusions, hallucinations, cognitive deficits, all of them diagnosed today still by a manual called Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 4. It's useful, but it is only a compendium of clinical symptoms. Today, still, there is no physical, biological, or chemical test for the diagnosis of either of these diseases. The lifetime prevalence is high. The risk of suicide is high. And most importantly, these patients with mental illness have a 20-year reduced life expectancy on average, as told to me by Tom Insel, with enormous fiscal costs and emotional costs to both patients and families. 
because we understand nothing, basically, or didn't in five years ago, about the basic underlying biochemistry and physiology of the disease, mechanistically, there has been no increase in the number of new mechanistically distinct drugs over now the last 60 or 70 years in medicine. And that's in stark contrast to heart disease because of enormous amount of work that's been done in that field to elucidate the underlying biochemistry and pathophysiology of the disease. These major risk factor for these two diseases is genetic. If you are a sick person, if you are a proband with either disease, and you look at the risk to, the, uh, to one of your first degree relatives for getting the disease, it's a seven to tenfold increase for each disease, for each disease in that family compared to the man on the street. But the genetics are complex. They're not simple Mendelian genetics. And despite all the efforts and hard work that went into the field before three or four years ago, finding the genes for these diseases was, I think, literally an impossible problem because the methods and information simply weren't available. And without going into a lot of technical detail, I would simply tell you that current and evolving methods in human genetics, starting with the sequencing of the human genome, first published in 01, finished in 03, a, a map of human genetic variation called the HAP map, and a lot of technologies around that that allow you to use that information, and a lot of computer algorithms that allow you to analyze it and make sense of it, make this now an approachable, although hard, problem. Before the onslaught on this problem using modern genetics, there was only one gene in one large extended Scottish family that had credibility as a risk gene for schizophrenia or uh, major depression. It was named, it was discovered, in, the family was discovered actually in 1990 and published and 10 years later, the gene was cloned. It was a gene where there's a translocation between a gene on chromosome one and chromosome 11. The gene was disrupted by the translocation and so it was called disrupted in schizophrenia one. Everywhere on the slide, you see a little star. Uh, it's hard, uh, one, of, one of these is a family member who has the translocation, and everywhere there's a fully blackened in triangle or half blackened in triangle, the person has some form of severe mental illness. There is not a one-to-one -one correlation between the translocation and the penetrance uh, getting the illness, but there's a high penetrance, and it is credible evidence that this gene was involved in some way in the pathophysiology of their disease. A number of people have worked on the biochemistry of this protein uh, over the last uh, seven or eight years, but the Psy Lab here at the Picard Institute in collaboration with Steve Haggerty and John Madison and the Stanley Center discovered last year a very important function of the disc protein, probably thus far the most important function discovered and that it regulates the proliferation of progenitor cells in embryonic and adult brain. It does so by interacting with and inhibiting an enzyme called glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta, which when inhibited stimulates a, a set of gene transcription events. And the implication of this work, which was published and highlighted in Cell last year on the cover, is that a safe specific chemical inhibitor of GSK3 beta might actually be a new way to approach the treatment of psychiatric illness. And we have a project ongoing in the Stanley Center to try to get such a compound. From the whole genome studies in both populations and families, this slide summarizes um, one aspect of the findings in both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And this work comes from the work of Pamela Sklar and Sean and their collaborators with the International Schizophrenia Consortium, Jonathan Sabat at Cold Spring Harbor and his collaborators, Decode Genetics, and Maria Cariugu at uh, now Columbia University in New York. There are several findings, and they're the first such findings in these two diseases. First, in schizophrenia, there's an excess of gene deletions in uh, single genes as a population. One example is the gene norexin, and there are other genes that have been uh, implicated in this that I'm not going into as part of this part of the talk. So there's an excess of single gene deletions. Secondly, there's an excess of large recurrent deletions on a series of chromosomes listed on this slide. And there's a duplication, at least in one family, that's been indicated. 
So patients with schizophrenia have excess gene deletions of two kinds, single genes and recurrent large deletions, and some duplications. In bipolar illness, the evidence so far does not support a major role for gene deletions, but does support a role for gene duplications on a number of chromosomes. So what is this trying to tell us, and what does this mean? Well, I think what it means is we've discovered in our field of psychiatry what's been known in other fields, and especially in another field of neuroscience. And Jim Lupsky, who's a terrific human geneticist at Baylor, st has studied and the genetic basis for two different kinds of neuropathies which occur in people. And one is called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. And it's re a, a demyelinating neuropathy, and it's due to a duplication of a gene on chromosome 17. A related but distinct clinical syndrome is related to a deletion of the same gene on chromosome 17. So these regions that uh, give rise to these kinds of excess duplications and deletions are about 200 of them in the human genome. And because of the anatomy of these regions, because the genes are flanked by repeat sequences, they undergo a peculiar kind of recombination which leads to errors and can lead to either duplications or deletions. This is exactly what's going on in some percentage of patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. In addition, in this case, there are rare mutations without the gene rearrangements, which have occurred in the same gene that's, that's, that's disrupted in the uh, two cases above it. We don't know yet in the case of schizophrenia or bipolar disease whether there are rare point mutations in some of the genes altered in the duplications and deletions but that's a direction that Pamela Sklar and her colleagues are carrying out. So what have we learned? We've learned some of the copy number variations, increase or decrease, are inherited. Some are new as a baby is born. They increase the risk, but they're not Mendelian penetrant. Some of them, in fact, are inherited from unaffected patients, unaffected parents. Interestingly, this clinical spectrum of the illness associated with these gene rearrangements, copy number variations, can differ from schizophrenia to autism spectrum disorder to bipolar illness, and we don't understand what accounts for the clinical variation yet. There are a number of hypotheses. The good part about it is they're testable. From, gene, from, D, from DNA gene sequencing done at a fine enough and precise enough level, I think we'll find out some of the answers as to what determines the clinical spectrum, and I won't go into uh, the hypothesis of the several hypotheses in the course of this talk. But it does highlight the importance of DNA sequencing on a large scale in this field to bring to bear that yet new technology to understand the genetic architecture. In addition, Dr. Sklar and her colleagues in DECO Genetics have found a number of common variant genes that confer a low level of relative risk, just the way PPAR gamma does in type 2 diabetes or HMG-CoA reductase does in elevated, for elevated cholesterol. There are two genes that have been published on from her work in bipolar disorder. There are others which she has found which she'll be writing up soon. There are four that have been noted in schizophrenia. They open up whole new dimensions to the biochemical approach to understand the pathophysiology, and there are more coming again from the work that she's carrying out in the Stanley Center. So this, from both, we have both a number of new genes that have bona fide risks for the diseases. They open up the biochemistry and the biology in the same way that fibrillin did for Marfan syndrome. We have tremendous collaborations with people at, in uh, both the uh, Pickauer and the McGovern Institute. And we're in a great position with the emerging genetics to unravel the biology in the same way that Dietz did for Marfan syndrome. The third finding is a really novel finding by Sean and Pamela and their colleagues. And it, it uh, is a discovery of a series of gene alleles, variants in the genome, that are in the uh, upper part of the statistical analysis of these genome association studies. So you can think of them as a, as a genetic signature at the DNA level. And the results are simply depicted here without going into the details as bar graphs 
to indicate that this signature, initially detected in a group of patients with schizophrenia, detects a population of patients with schizophrenia, three other populations, two other populations of patients with bipolar disorder, and does not statistically detect the populations of patients with six other unrelated medical diseases. So this result, <clears throat> we've talked about earlier that there are some genetic distinctions so far between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. This result shows that they also share a number of genes in common, although we don't yet know which genes those are, and that will take a significant amount of work that's ongoing. We believe that this result is consistent with a family epidemiology study published in The Lancet last year by our Swedish collaborators. And because, again, Sweden has a healthcare system and you can identify people both from the time they're born and when they go into the hospital, they did a large retrospective epidemiology study. And this study showed for the first time, not only is the risk, if you're a proband, not only is the risk to your first degree relatives if you have schizophrenia, elevated for them to have schizophrenia, it's also elevated for them to have bipolar disorder. And the reciprocal is also true. If you're a proband with bipolar disorder, the risk to your first degree relatives is elevated for bipolar disorder, but also for schizophrenia. Now, the genetic measurements that John and Pamela are making don't prove that what they're seeing in their epidemiology study is what is being measured in the genomic studies. But eventually, presumably, and hopefully, there will be some correlation and better understanding of that. So we have shared genetics, common copy number variants, polygenes, Swedish epidemiology, perhaps some other shared associations. We also have the beginnings of distinctions in genes that are deleted or duplicated. We're really scratching the surface, but it's clear we have begun to get at bona fide discoveries about the underlying genetic architecture of the disease. We've also made a hypothesis based upon some of the genetics and biochemistry that's known that there's a pathway, the Wnt signaling pathway, that we think is involved in the pathogenesis in some way. This comes from two or three different kinds of observations. Oops, sorry. It comes from the um, work that Leeway and uh, John Madison have done in showing that the disc gene inhibits GSK3 beta. Lithium works in the same pathway by activating this enzyme called AKT and thus inhibiting GSK3 beta. In the association studies in schizophrenia, both from the work of the ambassador at Toronto and from Pamela in the, in the Stanley Center, a, a enzyme that's involved in the synthesis of phosphatidyl and acetyl phosphate is a variant of that is associated with increased risk for psychosis. And one of the genes deleted on chromosome one in the gene deletion in schizophrenia is a co-regulator of the TCF left transcription pathway. So we think there's kind of an outline here for the first time of some biochemistry, and we're trying to take advantage of this in our drug discovery. Hardly, this is hardly the full answer. It's like the very beginnings of understanding the biochemistry of oncogenes work, but it is a beginning. We've employed, based on the work of Yamanaka and the subsequent follow-up that a number of people have done in many other situations, with our collaborators at the Mass General Hospital have been terrific, Roy Perlis, Don Goff, Jordan Smoller. Pamela and Steve have organized a collection, a separate collection from the gene discovery collection of fibroblasts from patients with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and controls, where they will, where they will uh, elucidate, they will define what the genetic abnormalities are in these patient cells and be able to study them through the production of iPS cells and subsequently into neurons and begin to work out the underlying differences in the differentiation pathways and biochemistry of what might be going wrong as a function of the abnormal genes. So even though this is primitive and this is much different and much harder than focus assays for tumor viruses, it's the first time we've been able to approach in the field a cell culture way to approach the study of psychiatric disorders. And it's a major technical milestone in the field, even though it's very hard and it will take a long time. We've also instituted, with some additional funds we've raised, an outreach program to the broader neuroscience community to try to find new creative ways 
to find molecules that might modulate new emerging pathways from the genetics to come up eventually with new treatments for the disease. So Stuart Schreiber and his colleagues Robert Gould and Mike Foley have set up a wonderful chemical biology and novel therapeutics program at the Broad. It's a state-of-the-art facility with high-throughput screening. We can do anything that any pharmaceutical company can do in this regard, except at a smaller scale, obviously. But we've raised the money and, and now enticed into our program because we can underwrite the work that will go into the development of some novel screens to find novel probe compounds and even some follow-up chemistry and biology. And we've been started this just last February, and we now have a half a dozen absolutely first-rate first people in neuroscience from other parts of the country, and one group in this, in this city, who are outside the Stanley Center, but whom we, we will be working with and are working with in the uh, CBNT program to develop these high-throughput screens to open up chemical approaches also to the biology to complement the genetics and to try to stimulate the industry to work on novel ways to approach treatment. So we've really got, for the first time, an intellectual approach to the problem. And it's hard, but you don't have to guess anymore. There really is an approach to improvements, to make improvements. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel, even though it's long. So the question is, going forward, what can we actually accomplish? I sat down as a function of this talk and thought about what I considered major milestones in biomedicine where people working at MIT were responsible for the discoveries. And I listed four here. And I think everybody in the room will know who did them all and, and their fantastic pieces of work over the last 30 plus years. They are truly major milestones. I did not include on the slide studies done that were just as important by people who are professors in MIT, but they actually the work wasn't done, the seminal work wasn't done when they were at MIT. So the question is, in this field, in our program, can we achieve any of these? And I think there are three potential, three potential milestones that we might think about going forward. First of all, <clears throat> will the Broad Institute harness its tremendous power in human genetics in collaboration with Pamela and Sean and the Stanley Center to be the first to really unravel the full genetic causes of psychotic illness. The second milestone would be whether neuroscientists in the MIT and Harvard community can translate that genetics into the underlying disease biology. Knowing Leeway, McGonker, and Bob, I have no doubt whatsoever that that will happen here at MIT. And I have no doubt, knowing Stuart and Robert and Mike, that there will be tremendous insights in chemical biology that will lead to uh, improved treatments and preventions for these illnesses. When will this happen? Will it be soon? <laughs> or will it take a very, very long time? It's not clear. There will be many challenges and many turns and twists. And I want you to remember over the years <clears throat> while I'm involved in this program or even after I'm involved in this program, the Crixivan story. Because the impossible really was achieved with the combined power of a galvanized effort, rigorous science, necessary resources, and passion. It really, this patient really was a miracle and what was achieved in that field in my view, was a, really was a miracle. And I believe this community can do it again in this field. Again, I want to thank the members of the Stanley Center and the Broad Platforms for the incredible dedication they've had to this project. And I want to finish on the last slide by thanking a number of other people in my personal history. First, David, Todd, Eric, and Stuart for encouraging me to come to the Broad. Ed Merck, Roy Vagelos, who recruited me to Merck, Linda Distelrath, who kept the AIDS activists from picketing us, 
And Irving Siegel, who was an amazingly talented genius in science, whom I still miss. It is a true tragedy what happened that I think in some way I will never quite get over. And NIH Marshall Nuremberg, who's not only a great scientist, but a great teacher about the beauty of science and how you do science. And Wally Rowe, who unfortunately died early of colon cancer, get your screening done, and taught me how to do virology. And lastly, Boris Magasanik, who when I was an undergraduate at Harvard College, was my tutor. And when Boris became a professor here at MIT, he encouraged me in 1960 to come down to MIT and take the course that he and Salvador gave in bacterial physiology, which in my undergraduate life was the most important course I took in science. So I thank you all, and I thank Dean Kasner for inviting me to give this. It's really been fun putting it together. There's one here, but we can pass it around if we have to. Yes, a gentleman there. But you can just you can just talk loud. It'll be fine. Yes, it's fine. Given their relationships, is, there, is it common or uncommon that the same individual will have clinical symptoms of both schizophrenia and bipolar disease? Not being a clinical psychiatrist. Yeah, in fact, I'm told by my psychiatry clinical colleagues that at the beginning of a clinical illness, it's sometimes very difficult to distinguish which illness they have and that only by following them over time that you can actually put them in one category or the other. But your question, the most important part of your question that you're getting at is really the critical part of the field. On the one hand, way over here somewhere, there's kind of classical schizophrenia, you know, bad cognitive deficits, hallucinations, and then way over here somewhere, there's somebody with mania and minimal cognitive deficit and some depression. And then there's this whole spectrum in between of patients who don't fit into the typical categories. And there's something called schizoaffective illness. And if you ask people what that is, there's no clue what that is. So your question's right on. And eventually, we're going to make these diagnoses based on the underlying genetics and biology, not just by the clinical symptoms. That's what's going to happen over time. I can't answer that. I don't know. Pamela, what would you say to that? Well, you want to just speak? So there's a large overlap with some of the hallmark symptoms of the same for both. So psychosis, which is part of it, I think, when we're approaching the study of psychotic diseases, is the prominent symptom for bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And so it's the rest of the associated symptoms that are what distinguish them. I think if the answer to your question would be yes, in this funny arena called schizoaffective disorder, where people really can't be distinguished as having all of one or all of the other, they have the worst of both. That would be sort of the simplest way to think about it. Yes. Morphomolecular? Ortho. Ortho-molecular. This, uh, my, I, I was led to this very recently, so I'm just starting to learn about it. But this line of reasoning uh, led him to connect neurospora, the work in neurospora, the fungal model, um, to human disease or human conditions. 
So my question is, how does the Broad see model organisms, for example, the yeast, um, in, this, in this effort, this bipolar and uh, disorder and schizophrenia disorder? Right. How do they fit? Yeah, we have, we have work, uh, collaborators that uh, are working on model organisms with some of the genes that have been uh, elucidated so far. There's some work that's being done in zebrafish. There's some work being done in Drosophila now with, between Pamela and a collaborator at Harvard Medical School, actually I think is in the audience right here. Um, and there's no doubt that the function of the genes and the pathways involved that studying model organisms will help understand the underlying biochemistry. Whether yeast or not, I, I can't answer that, but model organisms certainly are important. Yes? I'm curious about the case with the common variants that you talked about with the statins and the PBR gamma. I wonder if you could say a bit more about what it is in those common variants that led to, say, Medicor um, actually having the tenfold greater effect. What, what was different about those? Because a naive approach might say, oh, there are all these common variants we, we know about through, say, HAPMAP. You know, why, why don't they work? What was special about that case? And what can we do with common variants? Right, well, okay, so first of all, just again, historically, the drugs that work on those two gene products were discovered before the common variants were known to confer a risk. But, so I don't think there's anything special about them. I mean, I think you're seeing the evolution of human genetics and, in a sense, targets for drug discovery. Mendelian genetics could be done before three or four years ago. Common variant genetics and less, you know, less common, a little rarer, that's all approachable now. There will be an enormous plethora of biology discovered that way, and among the pathways, there will be large numbers of new drug targets that will come from that once the pathophysiology of various illnesses is uh, beginning to figure out. There are examples in age-related macular degeneration and Crohn's disease by work from Romnick Xavier at the MGA. There are lots of examples emerging from this. So when you read the articles in the newspaper about the demise of the pharmaceutical industry because there's nothing more to work on and there's not, they don't know what to do, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's a true, you know, it will undergo a resurgence as the biology that is being uncovered through the genetics leads to clearer insights in what to do. I think we'll take one more question. Yes. Hi. Uh, I'm one of your slides and from the You've shown that genes linked to schizophrenia and bipolar are also linked to autism. Now, there's some evidence, well, Matt, depending on how you look at it, there's a lot of evidence showing that autism is increasing. Is there any relationship between the increase in autism and the incidence of schizophrenia? What I'm really asking is the incidence staying constant for schizophrenia and bipolar disease as autism increases? I think the simple answer to your question is yes. I don't know of any evidence that the incidence of schizophrenia, but do you, uh, Pamela? It stays constant, yeah. There's been such flux in the diagnostic of bipolar. bipolar disorder, yeah. Yeah. Because DSM-4 incorporates this concept of a milder form of bipolar disorder, bipolar 2. Right. So there, the incidence Sort of all right. So we don't understand what's going on. These are early findings. Uh, there are a few other genes that have been found in autism which aren't associated with bipolar and schizophrenia so far. But I think your question is really important because presumably these diseases where there's overlap has something to do with abnormal brain development and we don't understand the biology well enough. And that's where they're fantastic problems in neurobiology. And now that there are human genes that are found that are associated with risk for the disease, studying their biology in basic neurobiology is not only an intellectually interesting and you know, important uh, intellectual problem, it has tremendous medical implications in the long run. And unless you have uh, first-rate neuroscientists working on the underlying neurobiology, it won't be figured out because psychiatry departments don't have people trained in basic neuroscience to work on these problems as the genetics starts to unravel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to close the session with two thank yous. First, to Mark Castor for hosting this event.
And I must say, I look forward to whatever events there will be in the future. And then secondly, to extolling for an interesting uh, and I think very exciting lecture today. Thank you both.